Our lecturer this evening is MCHA's fabulous director of collections, Bernadette Rogoff. This is her third lecture in this series, so if you missed the first two, you can catch them on our YouTube channel, which can be accessed on our website under the Learn tab in the menu. Bernadette has 40 years of museum experience and is a leading expert on the 18th and 19th century Monmouth County textiles, in addition to having a truly encyclopedic knowledge of our extensive collection. She amazes me every day with a fascinating fact, so she makes it really fun. So without further ado, please welcome Bernadette Rogoff. And welcome to Julia's Wardrobe, the garments of Julia Norton Hartshorn, 1868. She is not beautiful, but has a most expressive countenance and every varying emotion of her mind manifests itself in her face. She is as cheerful as a cricket, as playful as a kitten, and as graceful as your Aunt Cornelia, and throws herself into an armchair with the speed of an electric shock and be all right. She is tall and her form strikingly perfect. This is a quote from Julia's brand new father-in-law, Robert Hartshorn Sr., who sang her praises to family members back in Monmouth. Julia's husband, Benjamin Minturn Hartshorn, was born in 1826, a son of Monmouth County resident Robert Hartshorn Sr. Benjamin's ancestor, Richard Hartshorn, settled in Monmouth County in the 1670s and established the family property known as Portland. You see that on the left right there. Benjamin attended boarding school from the age of 10. He seems to have been a young man looking for a path. And in March of 1847, decided to go to sea, boarding a clipper ship, Hukwa, bound for China. After that voyage, which included a dramatic encounter with violent storms and the threat of sinking, Benjamin went back for more. And in January of 1850, he was aboard the clipper ship Samuel Russell, rounding Cape Horn, and arrived in San Francisco in March of 1851. His uncles Edward and Charles were already there, successful merchants in the raucous and rowdy city of San Francisco, abuzz with energy. Ben found partners willing to work with him in the steamboat industry. And he seems to have been one of these men who was a really powerful combination of steady and intuitive and established uh, steamboat lines in Arizona and San Francisco. And I just love this early daguerreotype of him, that strong, square jaw, straight nose, direct gaze. Um, he's just wonderful. And Ben found a perfect contrast in Miss Julia Love Norton. Uh, Julia was born in 1838 in Buffalo, New York. And she also seems to have had a little bit of an adventure streak. Uh, she and her siblings, her sister Lucinda and her brothers Henry and Edward, uh, settled in San Francisco. And in 1860, Julia was living in her married sister's household with nieces and nephews and her brother-in-law, William Moore. And Moore was the superintendent for the California Pacific Railroad Steamer Company. And we don't know, but this may be how Julia and Ben met. We have an unusual and truly beautiful description of Julia from the letters of her father-in-law, Richard. And here's another description. She is as sharp as a, meat, as a meat ax, as quick as a steel trap, as lively as a cricket. Last night, she, Mary, Ben, and myself were in the dining room. Suddenly, she made a spring and stood erect and unruffled on the dining table. 
I looked at her for a few minutes and then said, so stands the statue that enchants the world. And off she went as quick as she came on without an angular movement or disturbance of the symmetry of her redundant skirts. I just love that. I mean, you you have to love a girl who can make a standing leap onto a dining room table in hoops and petticoats. I mean, that's pretty amazing. Um, based on her father-in-law's descriptions, Julia may not have been, you know, quote unquote, pretty, but rather her attraction really stemmed from her energy. She was one of these people that you really had to meet in person to see their spirits. And Ben, actually, Ben's father actually mentioned in another letter that Ben's steadiness was the perfect contrast to Julia's liveliness. So we have a couple views here of San Francisco. Uh, the travel industry was booming and steamboats helped develop the West Coast. Uh, they brought gold seekers, merchants, explorers, workers, visitors, thousands of people all arriving from, for different reasons. And supplies and consumer goods also had to travel to these communities. So water travel was far easier than land travel. And Ben was really able to capitalize on that and found his own fortune. Ben had an excellent head for business. Uh, his high energy, his focus, uh, he really seemed to have an ability to juggle and handle successfully uh, a number of business interests, and that spelled success. Here are two advertisements for the Steamboat Company, and notice a little something at the bottom of the list of steamboats owned and operated by the California Steam Navigation Company is a steamboat named the Julia. So Ben named one of the company's steamboats after his wife. The Julia was a relatively small steamboat, only about 503 tons, but lovely nonetheless. Um, ben commissioned California artist Joseph Lee to paint a portrait of the Julia, and you see that portrait in the top right. And one of the photographs of the Julia may actually include its namesake. If you look at the image on the lower right, um, I've highlighted uh, several people standing and the woman on the right in what looks like a white summer gown may possibly be Julia. Um, the vessel, however, seemed kind of fated for bad luck. In 1866, its steam drum blew out and it killed five passengers and injured 11 more. And in 1888, uh, while approaching a dock at San Vallejo, a huge explosion destroyed it and the entire dock area, and she burned to the water line and sank. So let's talk a little bit about why Julia's wardrobe is so amazing and why there are pictures of this gentleman here. This is the one man who was responsible for Julia's motivation in acquiring a new wardrobe, and that was Charles Frederick Worth. His story is absolutely legendary. He was born in 1825 in Lincolnshire. The uh, father abandoned his family when Charles was about 11. Uh, he was apprenticed at the age of 12 to a department store. Um, and he learned the trade there. He really understood fabrics and textiles. Uh, he was trained as a tailor in the fine English art of uh, tailoring. And then in 1846, he struck out and went to Paris on his own. He spoke no French and had five pounds in his pocket. And he went to work at a firm uh, called Gaglins, uh, which sold silk fabrics and shawls and cloaks. Uh, he met his wife, Marie, there. And he designed and made dresses to show off these cloaks and used his wife, Marie, as sort of a, a living model and women were so taken by the cut and fit of these gowns that they started asking Worth to make them gowns that fit as well too. And um, he really didn't feel he was being appreciated at uh, Geglin, so he struck out again on his own and this time was able to get Princess Pauline de Metternich, who was a complete fashion diva, uh, to wear his gowns. He would make them for her free and hoped that this would catch the eye, and it sure did. At one reception, the Empress Eugenie saw what she was wearing and asked who the dressmaker was, and Worth was invited to visit her the very next day at the palace, and his fame was sealed. No more free gowns for Pauline. 
my favorite fact about Worth is that he would visit museums a lot and uh, he would really study a lot of older portraits, 16th, 17th, 18th century portraits. And he took inspiration from them regularly uh, regarding design, pattern, detail, and so on. And at one point, uh, there was a particular portrait of Queen Elizabeth and uh, it had the eyes fabric. And this was a brocade fabric that was woven with the picture of eyes on it uh, for her to show people that she had her eye on the entire kingdom and Worth had that replicated in silk brocade. So in the early 1860s, uh, the fashionable silhouette had a really round skirt line, it was supported by the cage crinoline and petticoats. It's relatively easy to walk in hoops, uh, believe it or not, I know that from personal experience, uh, but it's also challenging to, I don't know, walk through doorways, hold hands, basically move around. Uh, you can't get more than three feet closer to anything. It's like automatic social distancing. And the painting in the center is uh, actually depicts uh, the Empress Eugenie herself. She's the, um, the young lady at the very left with the highest head in the portrait. So Worth began to redesign women's fashion very rapidly and introduced a shift toward the rear. All the fabric used in the skirts were brought to the back and draped, and this created the start of the bustle. Trains, fabric which literally dragged on the ground, were very popular. And Worth was also practical, and at the request of Empress Eugenie, who loved to walk, she was a real health nut, uh, she did not like to walk with all that fabric dragging behind her. So uh, Worth actually invented the walking skirt, which was, <gasps> gasp, ankle length. And if you take a look at these images, keep these in the back of your mind, because when we get to see Julia's own gowns, some of them will look very familiar. And Worth also loved bold colors and trimmings. And the invention of chemical dyes made knock your eyes out colors possible. One of the real popular colors was a vivid electric blue. And you'll see that this ended up being one of Julia's favorite colors. So why is Julia's wardrobe so unusual? Many of the historic garments in our collection are beautiful. Uh, they come with amazing stories attached. Many people tend to save a special garment, a wedding dress, a prom dress, a tux, and so on. Um, I've worked with collections of garments from one person that present an overview of years worth of clothes, things saved through the years. Julia's wardrobe captures a single moment, gowns all made by the same dressmaker within the same time period in response to a distinct shift in fashion and all of them we can date to a single year. And not just one or two, eight, eight gowns, all with their unique details and accessories. I have never come across another collection quite like this one. So where did Julia go to get her wardrobe redo? Um, many dressmakers, even high style ones, didn't always label their gowns. Worth did, of course, but Julia's dresses aren't marked. It's easy to see that all her new dresses were made by the same dressmaker. Uh, construction techniques, fabric layout, decoration, lining treatment, and seam finishing. Uh, when you study them, you can really tell that the same person or people made these clothes. Uh, she certainly could have ordered all these gowns in San Francisco. High fashion was available, uh, perhaps even from here, Mrs. Chapman's first class millinery and dressmaking house. Uh, it's also possible that Julia had the gowns made while she, Ben, and the children were visiting the family members in Monmouth County in the summer of 1868. New York was very close at hand, and Julia could easily have gotten all the gowns made during their summer stay. So her fashion sense was described by her father-in-law in one of his many letters describing her elegance and bold style. I love this quote. And Julia's, Julia's fashion sense clearly made a firm impression. It's also really interesting to me because this is really kind of a commentary on San Francisco and West Coast fashion and its connection to the fashions of the East Coast. Remember that in 1868, 
uh, this was only, uh, and this was the year Ju Julia ordered her wardrobe. This was scarcely 20 years since the beginning of the gold rush. But because it was on the West Coast, water travel made accessibility to Europe possible, and the importation of fabrics and fashion was relatively easy. So let's start. First up on the runway is the electric blue striped gown. Uh, it's a one piece with a front closure. Julia was tall and had a very narrow waist. Uh, the dressmaker here really makes this blue and black striped fabric work. Uh, she cuts it so it forms this beautiful chevron. It's almost like an optical illusion. It's magnificent. Uh, the gown has a detachable sash and a swag, very typical of uh, the gowns of this period. You can see that swag in the far right, that loop right there, that's the swag, and that's attached to the removable waistband. Uh, and so the swag really focuses on the back view, and so Julia was going to look as great leaving a room as entering it. And the dress also comes with a gorgeous matching jacket out of this absolutely beautiful cotton plush velvet. It's for cool, but not cold weather. It's not lined and it was made relatively casually. It's a rather loose fit. And again, vivid electric blue, and it has these gorgeous large mother of pearl flat buttons. Next up, we have another favorite electric blue garment. And this is used as a silk satin ribbon trim on this gown of black cotton mesh netting over black silk. Uh, there's a lovely attached necktie and Julia could wear this fastened in a bow or worn long as streamers, maybe with a pin attached. And the dress has a couple of really fun accessory pieces. A detachable blue silk sash with a puffed swag drapery. You see that on the left. Uh, you can see that puff that's detachable and it's sort of a proto bustle. And it also has this amazing sort of shawl also of sheer black mesh with these great scallops trimmed in that electric blue satin. And like most of her dresses, it's really very simple, but it really relies on bold contrast and color for its ornamentation. Now I have to be honest with you, when I first saw this dress, this dress did not wow me when it was in the box. It was really difficult to read it visually. Once we got it on a mannequin, it was, not dead gorgeous. Um, the fringe is not pricky or delicate. It's actually very kind of bristly, um, but it's so striking. The trim just creates these bold lines. Uh, I mean, it just, the skirt looks almost like it's in perpetual motion with those lines around the hem. It's just, it's just amazing. And again, has a detachable sash and the large bold rosette you see in the top left and another sort of proto bustle in the back. Ah, this dress, I call this one French ribbons. Uh, there's a reason this gown isn't on a mannequin. Uh, I have a feeling that either the dressmaker or Julia or both were unaware of how this silk fabric had been treated. Um, in my experience, this is the earliest example I've run across of what we call shattered silk. Uh, usually you see this type of damage in gowns in the 1890s, 1900s, early 1900s. Uh, a heavy silk has weight and drape, but it also takes a lot of thread to achieve that weight. So in order to cut a few corners, uh, fabric makers uh, by the last quarter of the 19th century were soaking or otherwise treating their silk with metallic salts. Um, under a microscope, you see these teeny tiny pieces of literal iron permeating the silk fibers. And when it's first treated like this, it works really well. The silk really feels heavy. It has a beautiful luster and a drape to it. But those same little bits of iron uh, are as sharp as knives. And over time, they literally saw away at the silk. And there's no way to remove this or stop this. The deterioration will just continue. And Repeated handling makes it even worse. Uh, so that's why we have this dress displayed flat. Um, you can only stabilize the fabric, uh, but you really have to avoid extensive handling. Um, it's still breathtaking. Julia would have worn this to an afternoon reception. It has a, a rather longer train than most of her other gowns. And the gown itself is really pretty simple. 
It's the ribbons that add the wow factor. And there are three types used and you can see them here. Um, and then there's a third that's a black lace ribbon. And that adds another layer of this really subtle texture and depth. And I absolutely love these little panels or lobes uh, tucked into the waistband. And these are just attached at the top. So anytime Julia moved, they would actually move around too. So this was really a vibrant gown to wear. And here we have more stripes. Uh, this gown is really pretty similar in many ways to Julia's blue and black striped costume that we saw first. Uh, believe it or not, this is actually a, a stripe as well. You can get a sense of that at the uh, top center image, but the stripes are very, very narrow. And so at first glance, it appears like it's solid black, uh, but the burgundy and black contrast give it a real vibrance. And then the dressmaker used the rich red plush all over the place. Uh, there's this really fun sort of vest construction, and you can see that in the left-hand photograph. Uh, she's also created sort of this false lapel effect. And then these streamers actually uh, are attached just at the top by the shoulders and then flow freely down the sides of the dress and then attach in the back. Um, and I've never seen that treatment before. So this is this is really interesting to me. Uh, the bodice panels, as I said, they create this false lapel. It's a really lovely detail. And then the front panel, if you can see there, it creates almost this sort of apron effect. Also a really nice treatment. And another matching jacket. And this one is constructed virtually identically uh, to the blue plush jacket that we saw earlier. Uh, some of the different details are the buttons, which are just gorgeous. They're black stone and gold, uh, very high style. And then the back of the jacket comes to a point at the center. But Julia was also all about comfort. Uh, hot Jersey summers are going to need some cool fabrics. And Julia's wardrobe includes three lovely casual summer dresses, um, this is an instance where actually dressing mannequins end up showing something really interesting. And the summer dresses are two inches wider around the waist than her more formal silk dresses. And anybody who's worn a corset knows that two inches makes a lot of difference. And so Julia was able to wear her corset a little bit looser when she was wearing these uh, warm weather gowns. So I thought that was a really interesting discovery we made. Uh, this fabric is fascinating to me. If I saw just the fabric by itself instead of the gown, I would have dated this to maybe the 1920s, early 1930s. It's very Art Deco with this bold block and arrow, um, but it's sure enough, 1868. Um, and this is also interesting. You can see the construction at the far right at the bottom um, in order to make it a lot cooler so she didn't have to wear a lot of layered undergarments, there's actually a built-in little bodice that gives a little um, structure to the bodice itself. And those little rings that you see down the right side are actually removable buttons. So if Julia wanted to update the look or make it look a little different, she could actually swap out the buttons for another set. And here's another one, also very casual. They're all constructed the same way, and it's very easy to tell that they're made by the same hands. Um, all of them have the, these front closures, and that's called sort of a dog leg waist closure. Very easy to put on by yourself. Um, very easy to launder after a hot day. This one is a very simple fabric, spotted. And um, you notice that they're also practical because they have pockets. So Julia could carry around a handkerchief or whatever she needed. And this one is the simplest one of all. Um, it's totally white cotton gown. The accessories that Julia used with this dress would have played a big part here. Um, you could really see how using a different colored sash or a waist accessory or a pretty pin or a decorative neck ribbon or something like that would have really been able to change up the look. And another very important part of Julia's wardrobe are the petticoats. Um, we have several of her simple shorter petticoats, but we also have two amazing and elaborate petticoats also made up to the minute fashionable because of course, when the silhouette changed, the supporting undergarments also had to change. So 
These are all of lightweight white cotton with plenty of ruffles and fitted waistband with drawstring backs. Now, one of my favorite movie quotes is from the movie Steel Magnolias, where Olympia Dukakis's character says, what sets us apart from the animals is our ability to accessorize. And we are fortunate to have uh, three of Julia's hats, uh, four actually, four, four of Julia's hats. Women's headwear also underwent a dramatic change. During the 1850s and into the 1860s, uh, bonnets covered a good deal of the head and they really framed the face quite far forward. Lots of trimmings. You can see that in the center image there uh, very roughly. Um, you can see where they really encircle the wearer's head and there's lots of feathers and ribbons and so on. And it's also clear that by 1868, hats moved much farther back from the wearer's face. And many of the smaller ones just perched atop the wearer's head. And Julia purchased hats to go along with her new wardrobe. And although she could certainly have bought them in New York during her Monmouth stay, there were plenty of high quality millinery establishments, um, New York, San Francisco. So we're not quite sure where she bought them from, but they were very stylish. Now, I don't know whether she purchased them from uh, the dressmaker who made the dresses or from one of the millinery shops, as I said, either in San Francisco or New York. Um, high style dressmakers would regularly travel to Paris or London, and they would connect with their suppliers where they got their fabrics, ribbons, laces, trims, fake flowers, um, and ready-made bonnets, hats and cloaks, and other accessories. The hat on the left is made over a wire frame covered with black netting, black silk, and lots of black lace. Uh, I love looking at the details because that's what really sets these apart. These artificial flowers are wonderful. Um, you could do an entire talk about artificial flowers. Many shops paid pennies to immigrants to create these clusters for trimming hats. There's a good deal of history behind artificial flowers. Uh, the second hat on the right is known as a toque, and it was incredibly up to the minute stylish. Uh, if you notice the long black lace streamers, uh, they would echo the movement from the trains of Julia's garments. And so once again, this is really focusing on back interest. And the correct way to wear these was to slant it forward on your head. So it kind of dipped down over your eye and it was not meant to be worn halo style. Julia really seemed to favor black for many of her hats. This is the third black one in her hat wardrobe. Uh, again, it's made over a wire armature with plenty of black lace and um, some black moray silk ribbons. Um, the inside of the crown is stiffened and supported by a piece of buckram. And once again, more artificial flowers. And this time they really look like these really fun little cluster of sunflowers. Um, I will point out that the 19th century was not matchy matchy. I remember my grandmother Bernadine making sure her gloves and her purse and her hat and her shoes all matched. This was the 1960s. This was not a goal of the 19th century. Hats could be a relatively inexpensive or less expensive way to update your look. Many women would trim their own hats or brought their hats back to the milliners for new trimmings or for a fashion refresh. And this is the fourth hat in Julia's wardrobe. And this one is the one I consider most kind of heartbreaking. Uh, this is such a gorgeous piece with all that rich burgundy velvet, the burgundy satin ribbons, the lace, the graceful feathers. This is a statement piece. And I would bet that Julia purchased this hat to go with that beautiful uh, velvet plush red and black striped gown. You can really see how this would this would contrast with it beautifully. And Julia never wore this, not even once. It still has its original tag, still attached to the end of one of the ribbons with the original pin. Uh, I'm still researching the Maison Charles Marx. It's a little challenge because when you Google this, you get a lot of hits from Karl Marx, the communist who was most certainly not a hat maker. So it's really rare to have a hat retain its original tag. And why did Julia never wear this hat? 
Uh, ben, Julia, and their children returned to San Francisco in the fall of 1868 after a nice long visit with the Hartshorn family. Uh, they returned from New Jersey and arrived just as a smallpox epidemic was sweeping San Francisco. Julia got sick. We don't have a record of exactly what she fell ill with. Uh, we do have records indicating that the entire family, other than Julia, was inoculated. And the only vaccination at this time really was the smallpox vaccination. Um, interestingly enough, Julia's cause of death was listed as exhaustion rather than smallpox. Uh, on that list uh, of deaths that day in San Francisco, 11 other people on that page had smallpox noted as the cause of death. So we don't know why uh, Julia's death was listed as exhaustion. I mean, did she have smallpox? Did Ben not want her death listed as smallpox for some reason? Or was she sick with something else? Was she suffering from a heart or a lung ailment? Uh, we may never know. In any event, Julia died at the age of 30 on February 3rd, 1869. And the following day, every steamship in San Francisco Bay flew their flags at half mast for Julia. Ben did the best he could. Uh, he continued working. He oversaw his business interests, steamboats, banks, and so on. Uh, the 1870 federal census shows that Benjamin and his three children uh, had consolidated households with Julia's sister, Lavinia, and her family, uh, with seven-year-old Julia, named after her mom, four-year-old Robert, and two-year-old uh, Mary. Uh, I imagine Benjamin would have welcomed help and comfort from the family. Ben decided at some point to move back home. His father, Robert, suffered a stroke, and he most likely felt it was time to return to Monmouth County and shoulder some of the responsibility for the family's property here. Uh, he divested himself of some business interests. Uh, he did keep others, though, relying on trusted friend and colleague, John Birmingham, to keep things go going. Uh, John served as his agent in San Francisco for many years. And so Benjamin packed up the household, including the trunks containing Julia's wardrobe. And the trunks were placed in the attics and moved from descendant to descendant. Every so often, a family member would unpack and refold the gowns, layering them in clean cotton sheets and tissue paper. Ben never remarried. He died in 1900 at the age of 74. And that's his walking stick at the bottom left. And in the center is a gold and quartz nugget inset in the top. And what about Julia's children? Uh, her daughter, Julia, uh, inherited her mother's love of textiles. Uh, this one took the form of needlework. Julia Hartshorn Trask assembled an incredible collection of early American needlework, including samplers and related embroidered items. Uh, like every good curator and collector, uh, she also understood the importance of context. Uh, so her collection included some amazing examples of early English needlework, including pieces stitched in the 1600s, like the reindeer panel you can see at the bottom left. She donated her entire collection to the Monmouth County Historical Association in 1946. And the collection was of such fine quality that it would have been welcomed at national museums. And instead, to honor the memory of her parents, Julia Hartshorn Trask placed it here at MCHA. And in 1953, she also donated the Hartshorn bed hangings. And uh, this is the second most complete set of American made embroidered bed hangings known to survive. And they date to about 1750 or so. Julia's son, Robert, was uh, also a collector of sorts. He inherited the Hartshorn property and made improvements. Among much else, he was a lot like his dad, I think, because he, he seemed to have more energy than any three people. Uh, he raised a prize-winning herd of Guernsey cattle, and he really focused on agriculture and modern agricultural developments. Um, he was appointed as a special advisor for the United States Army, and he traveled to France in 1918 to help French farmers rebuild their lands after the devastation of World War I. Um, uh, Hartshorn family descendants donated a lot of the items that Robert collected, um, and I, I like to call it a World War I in a box, uh, because in a box no bigger than a shoebox, uh, Robert put together an incredible collection of commemorative medals and medallions, 
and other ephemera that really uh, tells the entire story of the First World War. They say first impressions are lasting. I believe they are and hope so, for never did a girl make a more agreeable impression upon strangers than she has made upon us all. And that was her father-in-law writing to one of Ben's brothers in March of 1862. So thank you so much for your kind attention. Uh, before we get to questions, I just wanna give a big shout out to several people. Um, I would like to thank from the bottom of my heart, the generosity of the Harsher and family descendants, some of whom are listening to us this evening, uh, for donating these garments and for donating so much of the family history of the Hartshorns to MCHA. Uh, it's one of the things that makes our collection so very special. Uh, and it's the generosity of people like that who keep us going. Um, I'd also like to give a big heartfelt thank you to Joe Hammond, uh, whose research on and the finding aid for the Hartshorn collection is absolutely amazing and made putting this talk together absolutely completely easy. Um, I'd also like to thank our executive director, Shannon Eden. She is astonishing and amazing to work with. And my colleagues and very dear friends, Dana Howell and Joe Zemla and Kim Bedetti. And I'd also like to uh, thank, I don't know if she's listening because she's right now spending a sem semester in London, uh, our last summer's intern, Charlotte Frick. Uh, just an absolute joy to work with. And we have all of those stunning photographs of Julia's wardrobe because of Charlotte's skills and artistry with her camera. Thank you very much. Okay. Dana knows how to do all the stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to do any of that. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hi. Um, so the chat's going to come to me. Okay. All right. So we have some questions. Oh, I also forgot to tell everybody. Oh, oh my goodness. If you enjoyed this, would you like to see these gowns in person? Because that is going to be possible. We are going to open Julia's Wardrobe, the exhibition, uh, just in time for Weekend in Old Monmouth, uh, first Saturday and Sunday of uh, May. And that's going to continue through the summer until probably the end of August. So if you like seeing it digitally, you can see it in person. It's going to be great. Oh, I think so. It's going to be fun. So um, Kathleen would like to know what single year were the eight dresses created? 1868. Okay. And what did they use to dye the fabric? Oh, that's interesting. Um, well, not being a chemist, I don't have exact information. Um, before the 1850s or so, um, most dyes were based on natural elements, but that's when the joy of chemistry kicked into the fashion world. And uh, a lot of um, a lot of brilliant colors, emerald green, the electric blue that we see in Julia's gowns, all those very vivid colors start really to be incorporated into fashion. And on average, how much would you say they cost? I know that's hard with the yeah, conversion. No, yeah, that's a good question. Um, let's see. Well, these are pretty high style gowns. Now the cotton ones, the simple summer gowns, they wouldn't have been really all that expensive. Um, the silk ones though, they would have been very expensive, like the, the black silk one with the French ribbons. That could have cost twenty, fifty, hundred dollars. Um, and when a regular workman was bringing home, you know, maybe like, I don't know, two to five dollars a week, that kind of puts it into context. Um, what happened to the youngest child, Mary? Uh, I did not follow up with Mary, so I don't know. Um, but all three of the children came back to the East Coast and grew up here. And Charlotte's on, by the way. She's like, Charlotte! Oh, oh, hi, Charlotte! Oh, my God! What time is it in London? Charlotte's amazing. She's a great girl. She's just, oh, my gosh. She is, I mean, she has real just in, intuitive curatorial skills. We have a couple of people that want to know how they cleaned the gowns. Oh, that's also a very good question. Well, the white cotton gowns, they were easy. Um, you could launder them just like you would sheets, you know, run them through hot water and scrub them and so on. Um, everybody had their own, every laundress had their own pet um, cleaning products. Uh, so, you know, some of them were pretty poisonous chemicals. Silk, however, you did not wash. And so you would spot clean them with, um, I think benzene was, uh, you could buy benzene <laughs> openly and easily at a drugstore, a pharmacy. And 
sometimes you would do that. Um, we also have gowns in the collection that were unpicked, pinned, pressed, turned inside out. Uh, because most silks, unless they're like a woven brocade, really don't have an inside or an outside. And so you can turn them and get a fresh look. Um, I would imagine, though, that Julia was not cleaning her own gowns. Um, and laundry was really a heavy-duty job, so a lot of people would actually send their garments out to be cleaned. You were talking about the iron in the um, oh, um, yes. eat away at the silk, and I was just thinking how oh, it does the same thing in ink to paper. It's such a troublemaker. Exactly, exactly. Um, how much input did Julia have in the choice of the fabric and the decorations? And I would think that she had a lot, judging just based on her father-in-law's comments about how she dressed and her fashion sense and so on, I think Julia was a young lady who really what looked good on her, what she enjoyed wearing. Um, she has this really interesting combination of style and kind of simplicity in a way, like the white cotton dresses, very simple. And the, um, the silk dresses, while they're very elegant, they also have a rather sim simplicity of line. Um, and she's also kind of practical too, the matching jackets and the different accessories that you could wear or take off as you wanted. I think she had a lot of input. At this point, um, most women's gowns were made by hand. You didn't go into a store, you know, like Macy's or whatever, um, or Target or something and buy them off the rack. Most dressmakers, you could go in and buy capes or coats or things like that that weren't really fitted. Um, but for dresses like these, she would have had her measurements taken. And then the dressmaker and the, the staff would make them up. But Julia would be sitting there for quite some time picking fabrics. And they would be discussing what trims. And the dressmaker might have made sketches or something like that. OK, and one more. Um, how are the patterns woven into the summer gowns? Like that check pattern. Oh, well, the spots and the um, the block and arrow are actually printed. printed. Yeah, they're not woven. Yeah. They're printed on. Right. Does anybody have any more questions? Oh, and I see Charlotte said, Charlotte, you're up at almost one o'clock in the morning to be here. Thank you so much. Oh boy, I can't wait to get back. I hope you're having a good time out there. All right, this was wonderful. Thank you so much, everybody. And be sure, and if you haven't liked us already or follow us on Facebook or Instagram, be sure and do so because we'll be posting when the show is gonna open and we'll have a beautiful opening reception. I hope to see everybody there. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. Have a good day, everybody. everybody. Thanks. Bye.